fellowship with Bruce Trump Bauer and Paul Ford. Now, Paul asked me to go out on one of the rivers in our county because he wanted to show me the incredible resources available in our community and the importance of taking care of the environment in Ann Arbor County. Now, I'm always game. I'll try pretty much anything, and I'm fairly open-minded. Uh, I took it as a challenge because I thought he was going to write a column uh, really challenging me on my opposition to the stormwater tax. Now, whether or not you agree with the stormwater fee or tax, we can all agree that the environment is very important, and it's particularly important in our county. You know, the reason I moved to this county is because of the Chesapeake Bay. I grew up in East Baltimore in Row House, and I was just sharing in a conversation before I came up here that I didn't really see grass growing up. Our backyard was concrete. Uh, our entire community was concrete. And so, you know, understanding the bay and being on the water is not something that was familiar to me. In my late 20s, I was actually 27, for the first time ever, I went out on a sailboat. So I was living in Northern Virginia at the time. I lived there for a brief time. And I called a friend and said, you know what, I want to go out sailing. I want to see what it's like. So he called someone in Annapolis, and uh, the guy who owns Annapolis Reading got me on a sailboat to do a sailboat race. I loved it. Having never been on a sailboat or even a boat, um, it was an incredible experience. It was also a death-defying experience because it was a spring race. So uh, I did one of the spring races, it was April, and the mast was creaking, and I didn't understand the, the jargon, I didn't know what a line or a sheet was, and I basically held on for dear life. But I was hooked. I thought it was an extraordinary experience, and I came back every week until I moved to Annapolis just a couple months later. It is incredible, and it is one of the reasons that we all love living here. I can also tell you that in our house, uh, we have this much trash and this much recycling. So we max out the recycling bin every week. We turn off the shower when um, we don't need it or the water won't brush in our teeth. So it got to the point where my children were like, can I soak up uh, and leave the water running or not? That's how much discussion we've had about it. Um, of course, you know, enjoy the experience, but when you're brushing your teeth, you can turn the water off. So there's a lot of discussion about these things in our home personally. Now, I did push back on a new tax because I don't believe you can have a new tax every time you want to fix something. I just simply don't. And I stand by that position. But that doesn't in any way mean that I don't support the environment or believe that investment in our tributaries and our Chesapeake Bay is an absolute high priority for all of us. And it was very funny when we went out on the river that day Paul was pointing out to you know, camplets and you know, various um, significant parts of our community that border the water. And I said, well, my children have been to Boy Scout camp there, and they've been to surf for summer camp over here. It was all very familiar to me, and I think he was surprised. And he said, well, I want you to stand up and take, to, I, I want you to take a leadership role in this. I want you to take a position and make it clear that you're committed to the environment. I think you should have an environmental summit. And I said, I think it's a great idea. We should do that. We should all come together and talk about how we can work together in government, in the private sector, in nonprofits, to support the environment and to support our community. And that's why this started today. Now, this can't happen without some leadership. And so I'm going to take a moment. I never miss an opportunity to embarrass Eric Michelson. <laughs> <laughs> Eric has done a phenomenal job. He was my pick to run the stormwater program for the county. Now, I did get attacked for hiring an environmentalist to run our stormwater program during the primary election process. Uh, and I will tell you that I defend that position. If you, take ta if you take taxpayer money from citizens in our community, you ought to be good stewards of that money. We have a personal responsibility to be transparent in that process to make sure we hire the most qualified people to manage that money and do the best possible job serving the community and using that money for that which it was intended. Eric Michelson was the perfect person to run the program. Just as Chris Phipps has done a phenomenal job running the Department of Public Works. I always want to hire the best person for every job. He showed leadership, bless him. He showed collaboration. He showed a commitment to transparency. He's also an incredibly dedicated public servant. He's worked hard for our community for a long time. And when I brought this up, just bear in mind, I could have a great idea, but I wasn't doing the work. He put it together. So Eric deserves the credit 
for putting together today's events and for understanding the importance of communicating this work to our entire community. So I hope today is the first of many days, and whether I see Delegate Chu has joined us, whether it's Delegate Chu or George Johnson who runs our town meeting, I hope this event will continue. I would like this to be the first annual, and I would like us to move forward in our commitment to supporting the environment and doing everything we can to make sure that we are transparent in the process, but we also involve the entire community. This is important work for all of us. So I say thank you. Thank you, Tommy, Executive, and I appreciate the, uh, the introduction. My name is Eric Michelson. I'm the administrator of the Watershed Protection and Restoration Program. And to kick off today's event, what I really wanted to do was sort of set the stage for why a program like this uh, is necessary in Amarillo County and throughout the Bay Region, and what we're planning on doing over the next decade, couple of decades, to improve water quality in our local waterways uh, and just be bad. Really, in order to understand in order to understand uh, the situation that we're in and to get a handle on sort of the, all of the information that we get about the poor condition of our waterways, the Chesapeake Bay, we've been bombarded for this. I grew up uh, on the Severn River uh, during the early 80s here, and I was asked the other day, you know, sort of what's your recollection of the, the waterways growing up? Because a lot of folks, um, perhaps, uh, you know, a generation older than me, do, uh, do remember looking down, being able to see 10 feet into the bottom of the Severn River, seeing crabs on the bottom, uh, being asked by adults uh, you know, to, to clear the aquatic grasses in order to uh, allow boats to get in and out of, uh, of coves where the, the underwater grasses were so abundant that they were found in colors and whatnot. But in order for us to understand the condition that we're in, uh, it really it really requires us to look back, not just at sort of what are the contemporary issues on the land, which we'll talk about, but what are the historical issues on the uh, land? Uh, and how did we get here? Um, the you know, European colonists essentially have been uh, in this uh, vicinity for hundreds of years, been using the land very intensively. One of the interesting things um, that's been talked about a lot by uh, Dr. Grace Brush at Johns Hopkins University is how prevalent uh, beavers were on the landscape, uh, say, 400 years ago. There were nearly as many beavers in North America as there are people in North America at this point. And so many of our stream valleys were impounded uh, in these systems that were basically uh, sediment and nutrient sinks. Uh, within a pretty quick period of time, because of the commodity value of uh, beaver furs, uh, they were trapped out and functionally extinct from the uh, East Coast, almost within 100 years, really, of people getting established here. So that, that's one sort of land use change that's occurred. Um, very, it's very interesting, too, to, to recognize that uh, most of the North America was pretty heavily forested uh, during the pre-colonial period, so much so that when folks got here, or when Europeans got here, uh, there was actually some lamenting how, how forested the landscape was. It was they, people weren't sure they were going to be able to make a living because they had to have cleared land in order to conduct agriculture and that sort of thing. This is a shot from West Virginia from the, the turn of the century, you know, a white oak that's got a diameter of 15 feet. Those are the kinds of trees uh, that you might see, you know, in terms of redwoods on the west coast at this point. But the scale of, uh, you know, what was here, it's, it's hard to imagine. And thankfully, we've got some of these uh, historical photographs to give us a sense. Um, one of the interesting things about forest cover is that in the Bay Watershed, we actually have more forests cover now than we did uh, in the post-Civil War era, because so much of uh, the, the land was cleared for agriculture or to use uh, wood as a fuel or as a building material. Uh, much of that land, that era of the land, has laid fallow for the past 100 years and has reverted to forests. So we actually do have more forests, although we were losing some uh, in the condition of development. But that's, to look at these sort of patterns over time is, is an interesting thing to do. Um, when that land was cleared uh, during that post-colonial period, and accounts locally suggest that, uh, for instance, the south of the watershed, all of the virgin growth was cleared by 1650. So um, very soon after uh, the colonists moved in, there was uh, a very intensive use of the land. Of course, that resulted in uh, lots of uh, unstabilized so soils. I'm looking at the soil conservation folks in the background. You know, they've never let something like this happen nowadays. But, Certainly, uh, a lot of that soil ended up running off into our stream valleys and our waterways. Uh, in some cases, uh, there were uh, mill dams created throughout the county. It's hard for people to believe now because uh, a lot of those structures were earthen structures that are long since defunct, although some remnants of them exist. But 
there were a number of uh, mills on the Severn, the Magathy headwaters, uh, the South River, certainly the Toxin. And again, um, much of this area is now reforested and essentially unknown to us, but if you spend some time out in the woods or looking at the natural history of the region, uh, you can come across this information. That's what was going on on the landscape. On, on the waterways, um, these are photographs again from the turn of the century, I think 1912. Um, there were massive oystering operations, and you can see just the stacks of the oyster shell that were going on here. And the important thing to remember is that actually by the turn of the century, we were on the downward curve in terms of oyster abundance. So most of the, the heavy, most intensive harvesting had been done in the late 1800s. And so we um, really uh, did hammer that resource in terms of, um, in terms of uh, taking the oysters from the bay, removing that natural fil fil filtering mechanism in the waterways, and then of course in the, the middle of the 20th century, we, we've had situations with disease that have additionally uh, impacted that resource. Uh, this is another interesting piece. This is actually on Spa Road in Annapolis. Um, during the 1930s, uh, during the depth of the uh, Depression era, there were lots of make work projects for both, both civil, um, civil works projects. Um, in Maryland, there was basically a ditching effort that was expansive to uh, essentially try to remove mosquito breeding habitat. In this case, you can see uh, this report from the 34 shows Four, uh, excuse me, 500 acres of non-tidal wetlands drained in Edwardville County, almost 28 miles of new ditches in terms of trying to drain those waterways. And if you can't read the, the caption here, you know, they basically put the culvert as low in Spa as they could to drain the headwaters of Spa Creek. So a lot of what we're trying to do now from a hydrology and from a water quality standpoint uh, is correct those sins of the past. Um, that same kind of mentality, again, we don't see this as much in Interval County now in Mr. Down in South County, but on, certainly on the shore you see the agricultural ditches that have been put in place to, to drain that landscape of water. Uh, in the end, this is Bacon Ridge Branch in the, the South River headwaters where you've got an old straightened system that's overgrown now because there hasn't been agricultural use, but we've got sort of the legacy impacts of this, uh, this intensive land use all throughout the county. Of course, in other areas, and we were explaining to the county executive earlier, um, sort of the conventional practice from an engineering standpoint or from a civil engineering standpoint has been historically, let's get that water off the landscape as quickly as possible. Let's get it into a pipe. This is in Glen Burnie, uh, tributary to Pasco River. Let's get it into a channel. Let's vent it out to the waterway as quickly as possible because we all know the solution to pollution is pollution. So, you know, um, what we're doing again is looking at situations. This is a pretty egregious example. Um, but where we can reverse those trends, where we can store uh, water, provide water quality treatment where, uh, where appropriate, and um, sort of reverse some of those activities that we've done historically. This is a similar kind of site where you've got that uh, culvert or the, uh, the channel that's excuse me um, ended, and at the bottom of that, um, you know, you've got scour problems. You've got issues where that energy has just been transported through the system. And you can imagine the sediment and the uh, nutrient issues that the loss of this soil is creating downstream. So what we've done is we've converted our local rivers in the Chesapeake Bay from a system that was really dominated uh, by bottom biological activity. You had oysters, you had mustard, mussels, you had sponges, you had aquatic grasses that dwelt in the bottom that were able to metabolize the nutrients that came into those systems um, and, and incorporate them into their uh, their uh, mass, their biomass. And now what we've got a system is, that's dominated by activity in the water column. We've got nutrients that have come into the, our waterways. We've got these huge algae blooms that create cycles of um, hyperoxygenation and then um, anoxic or low oxygen periods when that material is decomposing on the bottom of our waterways, creating dead zones that we see. So what we're doing is living with a lot of the consequences of how our predecessors have lived on the land, but certainly um, that, that we've, got to, we've got to place in this and we've got to understand how these two pieces work hand in hand. So what does that mean for us? Um, each of us who's here presumably, uh, lives in a house, probably one that was built within the, the last several decades, um, and the infrastructure that's associated with that has had to go in. Some of us may fertilize our lawns, some of us may have pets, some of us may have uh, wet spots in our yard that we've worked uh, ourselves to try to, to drain and get, get rid of. So we've got our impacts that are sort of mapped on top of that historical land use. 
uh, addition of, I don't think any of us have these, but if you've seen some of the septic systems that are uh, in Ann Arbor County, uh, there's probably more than we'd be comfortable with that have fields that are in the water table or that are other kinds of situations. And so uh, while uh, we're dealing, you know, new homes have, are could be on sewer on septics, uh, the conventional septic system practice is really a 100-year-old technology, and it does what it was intended to do fairly well, which is handle bacterial issues and whatnot, but they're also very good at transporting nutrients into our waterways. But when we get back to our own houses, again, the water that comes down off the sky, the rain, uh, it's our rooftops, it's our uh, driveways, uh, eventually makes its way into sick roadside swales or, or curb and gutter. But we've got that water making its way into um, drainage systems, and a lot of people, probably not people in this room, but a lot of people think that when the water goes into this inlet, it goes to the wastewater treatment plant where it gets treated like uh, sewage or the water that's coming out of your shower. In fact, that's not the case in Ann Arbor County. These, all these inlet systems essentially end up draining to a situation where they are piped to probably the nearest creek or the nearest ephemeral waterway. Uh, oftentimes, in Ann Arbor County, certainly we have very erosive soils. Uh, and what you've got is many times situations like this where you've had a huge amount of energy basically piped off that developed landscape <coughs> coming out of the point. And again, you can see when this feature was installed, uh, it was the soil was probably four or five feet closer to the edge. It's created an enormous scour hole. And again, all of that sediment and all those nutrients associated with that sediment have now made their way downstream, probably into tidewater uh, where this discharge. Uh, there's sites like this all over the county, again, downstream of those outwall uh, locations. And you can imagine uh, the amount of sediment and nutrients coming from a situation like this that's really out of sight, out of mind for most people unless um, you've got sort of the, uh, the twisted passion where you'd like to go, you know, stop your car on the side of the road and say, well, where does that culvert lead? And, you know, you end up stumbling upon something like this. But that's sort of what we're in the business of at this point. And there are, unfortunately, lots and lots of situations like this. Eventually, uh, when that soil leaves those systems, it doesn't just stop uh, in the floodplain below. This is, again, the South River with the Route 2 bridge here below. Um, and you can see the sediment plume that's made its way out of the river. So after main events, or after that material has been mobilized, it makes its way into our waterways, uh, smothering aquatic life. One of the interesting things about this photograph, as you can see in those similar shots of the South River Magnifique, is that as you get towards the bay, actually, the water tends to be clearer for the most part. And after decades of monitoring, uh, our local waterways. That was a trend that we found pretty regularly that the, the um, tidal estuaries in Ann Arbor County were polluting the Chesapeake Bay rather than vice versa for the most part. That ends up leading again to situations like where we've got these uh, algal bloom advisories, uh, occasionally kind of har harmful algal blooms, which are actually can be toxic to people or to, um, dogs or wildlife. Uh, in many cases, the algae blooms, if nothing else, cause low oxygen situations consuming the oxygen when they end up dying off. Uh, we get that siltation can smother some of the remaining moisture beds that we've got. We've got that siltation coming down and just uh, covering them up before they've got the opportunity to clear themselves. Fish kills are not unusual when you get that low dissolved oxygen situation. And then we've got essentially a 48, uh, 48 hour blanket advisory from the health department to avoid water contact after those rain events because, uh, because of issues about bacterial Concerns uh, for human health. And again, um, as the county executive mentioned, I think probably most of us would agree we came to Arundel County, or perhaps we were born in Arundel County, but we stayed here because, uh, largely because of our local waterways. And that was the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, our rivers are really synonymous with Arundel County. It brings a lot of people here and keeps them here. And certainly, if you've got young children or you recreate in our local waterways, uh, I think uh, cleaning them up so that we don't have to worry about. Um, our kid has a scuff on their foot from biking and say you have to avoid you know, water contact until you end up healing up. That's a situation that's difficult for a child to understand, and I don't think it's something that we want to uh, uh, pass along to future generations. So what is our plan? Um, and I, I won't get too far into the details here. I think a lot's been said in the public, and this is a pretty high-level audience. But um, the county uh, has an interest in clean water in and of itself, but it never hurts to have regulatory mandates that get us there uh, as well. And what we've got right now is two uh, competing or, or dovetailing really mandates in terms of uh, federal and state requirements to improve water quality. 
think about our state stormwater permit, this MS4 permit, which requires us to treat 20% of the untreated impervious surface in the county uh, within five years. The cycle just began in February of this year. And so that's a very big obligation. That's really the primary driver in the near term of our uh, restoration program. And that's the target we're looking to hit um, uh, again within the next five years. This uh, occurs within the context of the Chesapeake Bay total maximum daily load, which is a requirement, set of requirements from EPA that basically restrict the amount of sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus that are supposed to make their way into our waterways on an annual basis. And so the work that we're doing to achieve the conditions of our stormwater permit uh, is doing double duty in terms of reducing the, these key nutrients into our waterways. Uh, and that's really the, the backdrop against which this occurs. Uh, again, not to belabor the point, but the program was created um, really with the passage of the local stormwater fee. The fee was phased in over three years. Uh, we're in the second year of that phase in right now. The way the residential program is set up is it's broken into three tiers based on zoning, and then there's a non-residential fee based on actual imperviousness times the, the rate of the fee. And then it's been set aside and a dedicated watershed protection and restoration fund that mimics the county's existing utilities for wastewater, water, and uh, solid waste. And so it's, it is uh, a standalone silo that's protected from uh, general fund usage. Our overall strategy, and again, I think uh, we, we're, we're in the place that we are because there's been a lot of forethought um, from the county and from public works since well before I, I came along. Uh, the previous director, uh, Ron Bowen, and the current director, Chris Phipps, uh, ha had made it a priority to uh, undertake watershed assessments, to get a better handle on what the condition of our existing waterways has been. And that's really been a 10-year effort at this point. The Sever River Watershed Assessment was done in 2004, um, and uh, we've got most of the county assessed at this point. There's several South County watersheds that we're in the middle of assessing. Uh, but that work has been used to set our prioritization or where we're going to uh, target our restoration efforts. As part of those watershed assessments, excuse me, we had consultants walk every mile of stream in these waterways. They identified areas where there were outfall problems, where there were garbage dumps, where there was uh, utility crossings or other kinds of obstructions. Uh, this is a headwaters of the Seven River where there's an exposed mammal structure. Uh, and so they really allow us to collect a tremendous amount of data to get a better understanding of what the existing conditions of these systems are. And what we've been able to do in, in many cases is uh, work with our highways folks or work with our utilities folks and make them aware of these kinds of things. Because again, there aren't a lot of people necessarily spending time uh, in these uh, stream systems uh, on a regular basis. And the data that we've collected has served, served a variety of functions. But it's allowed us to identify where those problem areas are. We've used those assessments then to create uh, prioritization for restoration and preservation models. We've looked at each of the sub-watersheds, which are small drainage basins which you, within each of these larger waterways, um, and looked at a variety of factors, including landscape indicators, including stream assessment, biological health, the physical condition of those systems, the model of pollutant loads, and taken that and plug that into an algorithm that says, these are the areas where when you do restoration work, you'll be able to get the best, the most cost-effective use of your dollars to get that work done. So in this case, again, in Severn, we've got watersheds that are highlighted in red or in orange, which are the areas where there is the, the greatest need in terms of water quality, retrofits, or improvements. The areas that are green or yellow uh, tend to be less highly developed or have less uh, pre-existing issue, issues and are potential targets for preservation where we can sort of maintain the status quo and, and hope that that um, is a condition that would persist. What we've done in terms of setting up our capital implementation program, we've got a six-year capital budget that's been, um, that was approved by the council last year. We've staggered our restoration based on a variety of factors, including the design complexity, the ability to get projects in the ground, the property ownership and that sort of thing, as well as construction funding. Many of these projects are uh, very expensive and uh, so the construction funding in some cases has been pushed to out years. Um, our restoration strategies, and again these are based on um, the BM, uh, best management practice efficiencies that are given to us by EPA and MDD in terms of um, reductions, uh, we've staggered a variety of strategies throughout the county. Um, many of the sort of historical stormwater practices, so um, 
say, in the, in the 80s and, and potentially in the 90s, a lot of stormwater management really constituted uh, flood control. That was really the goal, was to try to uh, minimize downstream flooding, not so focused necessarily on water quality improvement, but just not creating infrastructure problems downstream. So you have uh, many features like this, which is called a dry pond, where you basically are controlling the volume of water during a storm event, and then that water is metered out after the storm flows, and there's not a whole of water moving its way from the system. What we're doing is going into many of those systems and then converting them into systems like this, which is a uh, Shipley's Choice, a, a big dry pond basin, about three acres, where we've gone in and created a constructed weapon. So we've got opportunities for the volume control that we need because Charlotte Golf Course is down here and there's a whole bunch of other infrastructure. So we don't want to change that situation, but we've got opportunities to retain that water on the land, infiltrate it in, create habitat, create uh, water quality benefits in areas that are already uh, called out as stormwater practices. So that's sort of the low hanging fruit in terms of what we're doing. Uh, we're also looking at opportunities for alcohol restoration. This is another shot again where you've got that hardened infrastructure, you've got stone, you've got concrete conveyances or pipes that are discharging the natural systems and usually at the end of those systems you've got a disaster going on where you've got scour, you've got um, instability and these present uh, ripe opportunities both to halt this degradation and then also provide water quality benefits in those locations and again these occur all over the county. This is a little touch of watershed we crop in but um, they're, they're numerous. These are sites actually um, that have been restored using those kinds of techniques that the county is employing. This is uh, the Aurora Hills project downstream of the Millersville landfill in uh, Millersville. And this is a project uh, actually installed by the Seven River Keeper program in, um, off General's Highway in, uh, in Annapolis. Uh, and again, you've got safe conveyance of larger storms and then opportunities for water quality treatment during uh, smaller storms. University of Maryland, for instance, was studying this project and finding that storms, uh, the two year storm, which is a storm that occurs. Uh, on average, once every two years, um, it basically disappears in a system like this. It's sand bedded, there's smaller events basically get um, uh, flow into these systems and then just simply infiltrate. Bigger storms like this one obviously still pass through and you want to be able to convey those safely uh, during uh, those larger storm events. And then screen and wetland restoration. This is the uh, North Cypress Branch site, uh, which is just next to the Coles in Spur Park, uh, a county, a huge county capital project that was completed last year. Um, was basically a, uh, a, a ditch system down to the Magnet River. Uh, the impetus for this particular project was the county had gotten a dredging permit a number of years ago and the Corps of Engineers required uh, arresting the sediment source in order to uh, ensure that it weren't back for another dredging permit in five or ten years. And so the county came in and basically uh, restored that area and created a, an enormous stream of wetland complex uh, it's behind the McKinsey Apartments, if folks know that area very well. You can see it from Ritchie Highway, and it's, it's a beautiful site. This is literally uh, maybe 18 months after construction. It's all greened up. It's very difficult to even tell that there's been a human uh, footprint in there. Uh, lots of aquatic uh, plants, uh, dragonflies, fish, amphibians, all sorts of things. So uh, those are the kind of projects that we're undertaking elsewhere in the county as well. And then we're also using monitoring to drive our restoration management decisions. So one of the things uh, that we're concerned about, that the public's also concerned about, is not that just that we're spending their money, but that we're spending their money in ways that's getting the results that we think it's getting. So we've worked with the University of Maryland uh, over the course of the past several years to monitor a number of our projects. We're in the process of reevaluating our monitoring program uh, so that we can be able to uh, get more robust data out of that and try to get a better understanding of what the benefits of our restoration projects are, both from a water quality standpoint, but also from an ecosystem health standpoint. And so uh, we take that charge very seriously. We recognize that there's going to be accountability with the public, and we also want to have that information so we can, uh, we can modify our restoration management plans going forward if we need to based on feedback. And so the opportunities and really sort of the impetus for this summit is not just what the county is doing, but what can the public do um, or what can our nonprofit partners do to um, expand our effort? Because, you know, although the county has a lot of impervious surface, 40% of the, roughly 40% of the impervious surface in the county is owned by public agencies in the state or the county. 60% uh, is owned by private property owners. And so there's 
we're always looking for opportunities to work with uh, private landholders to do projects on that property. In many cases, many of our projects are anticipating that we're going to have to buy easements or potentially uh, purchase properties to be able to do that. But to the extent that we've got the buy-in of the community, uh, it makes our lives a lot easier to be able to push forward with these projects as, uh, as folks are probably aware. There's some degree of skepticism and cynicism about uh, government's ability to get this kind of thing done at this point. So to the extent that we can build those relationships with folks um, like Watershed Stewards Academy and other people leading those efforts, we're happy to do so. Um, again, I'd be remiss, and there's, you know, Suzanne's going to be talking about the Watershed Stewards Academy later on today, but it's a great organization that the county, the Department of Public Works, Ron and Ginger, who's here, uh, were involved in working with the school system to set that up a number of years ago, and it's really grown into a, a spectacular model program for Animal County. The latest class of stewards is 45 folks from all over the county. We were presenting to them earlier this week about uh, some of the opportunities they've just kicked off, and uh, I believe this is in the seventh, <coughs> seventh class, I think. Um, and so we've got literally hundreds of people in the county who've been trained to, to be working in their own neighborhoods to do source control and to uh, educate their neighbors about the value of this kind of work. Um, we certainly uh, are looking for help with implementation assistance. Uh, our capital program manager, Sherry Lott, is in the audience here. She's right there in the back of her hand up. Uh, one of the things that we've done is, you can see we've done a tremendous amount of background work in terms of assessing our watersheds, but we acknowledge that there are gaps in, in our knowledge and that if there are folks who are working on the ground, people with watershed groups or community groups who are aware of a, a, a serious issue, we'd like to have those brought to our attention so that we can put, consider those as we do our planning going forward. And it may be something that we've missed uh, through our assessments, but we, we love pictures, we love descriptions of what's going on, and if there's willing landowners, we can certainly take that, take that into our calculus as we move forward with these projects. Um, we're also, we've got some county project managers on board, we've got some county project managers here today. Uh, we're bringing additional project managers on board. And what we're trying to do actually as we set that program up is have project managers working in specific geographic regions of the county so people who are with the Magnet River Association or South River Federation are able to say, you know, my project manager is Joe Smith and they can, if they've got questions or they've got um, suggestions, they can go directly to that person to be a conduit uh, into the program and build those relationships so that we've got that uh, working back and forth between the county and those uh, organizations. Um, and then, so again, this is uh, another site again where there's tremendous scour, like I say, sites like this. We're aware of many of them, but it's certainly possible that we might not be aware of them and we'd like to have them brought to our attention and people do know those. Um, and then finally, certainly uh, with groups like Watershed Stewards Academy or many of the watershed organizations in the county, there's the opportunity to take, undertake meaningful restoration projects. And, uh, to that end, one of the things that we're doing is setting up a restoration grant program in collaboration with the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Tom Lee's here and is going to be giving a presentation later on in the morning about um, some of the opportunities that are there. But we're taking money from the Watershed Protection and Restoration Program, setting that aside as was enabled in the county legislation uh, for nonprofit restoration grants. So HOAs, religious organizations, watershed groups will have access to those dollars to undertake restoration projects that will then be counted towards the, the county's efforts in terms of water quality improvements um, and will work in parallel with our uh, overall restoration efforts. And so we know that uh, there are lots of partners who are already undertaking millions of dollars worth of restoration in the county and we want to try to make that as easy as possible for those groups to do and we want to be able to leverage those uh, resources so that fewer county dollars have to be spent potentially. Uh, these are a variety of uh, Watershed organization projects. This is Cabin Ranch project that Fred Kelly, a riverkeeper up there, he worked with a private property owner who, who owns the Annapolis Bowling Lanes there on General's Highway to basically convert an old uh, dry pond basin into a project that won the most innovative stream restoration project in the Chesapeake Bay region last year for the, from the Chesapeake Stormwater Network. So it's a great site. He leads regular tours. I encourage folks to get out there. This is a project, uh, a million a million dollar plus project just installed by the South River Federation on Church Creek. You've driven over the 665 bridge uh, as it goes towards 50 and looked off to your right as you're going west. You may have seen it. It's a huge project just uh, recently planted. Uh, and again, another project. This, these, these projects are both on the scale of what we're undertaking as, as the county, so we're glad to have watersheds groups doing this. And then there's 
shop for recent planning uh, with the West Road River Keeper uh, and several school kids, I believe these were uh, folks from Long Vendo, who were doing a project on the Road River at Camp Letts, uh, where they had a uh, horse stable area that was being overgrazed, and West Road River Keeper worked with them to change the, the grazing patterns and also install a number of uh, restoration practices and reforestation practices. Um, in a way that you know, it would have been difficult for the county to do. And I'll say, uh, particularly on the camp leads and a couple of other agricultural practices, again, soil conservation districts, uh, collaboration has been key in that effort. They work with the agricultural community to try to make sure that they're implementing best management practices. And uh, to the extent that there are stakeholders who build trust with that agricultural community in particular, uh, it's critical to be able to get these things done. So uh, without any further ado, that's really the end of my presentation. Like I say, I think today there will be a lot of resources that will be presented to you. Um, Kirk Van Day from the South River Federation is going to be talking about some of the, re the restoration hurdles and logistics uh, that go into putting bigger projects in the ground, and I think is a really great, great resource. Uh, Tom's going to be talking about some of the grant uh, opportunities that are available. And Suzanne is going to be talking about uh, the Watershed Stewards Academy, which if you're not familiar with it and you're interested in getting more involved in your own community, would be a really great session to sit in on, um, and it's a great resource. So uh, I appreciate everyone being here, and again, I hope this is useful for you all, and uh, look forward to meeting you with another you already. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, sure. Any questions? Sure. Uh, what's the relationship? Between the county's efforts and the city of Annapolis's efforts. The city has 4,800 acres of property in the county. Right. What's the relationship between the two and, and the need to have projects in both communities? It's, it's a great question, and I'm just looking back to the map here. So, this area here, this sort of white on our map, that's actually the city of Annapolis. And and from a regulatory standpoint, the city has its own sets of obligations. They have their own stormwater permit. They, they were at the table in terms of the de development of the county's watershed implementation plan, but they've got their own separate set of obligations. And we're, we've been working with both nonprofit groups that are doing work in the city, uh, providing letters of support, trying to support those efforts. And, uh, you know, I think look forward to continuing to build a relationship with the city as it moves forward with, with its process. I think that. The county um, uh, is really uh, very far ahead, and we're happy to serve as a technical resource for uh, other jurisdictions, including the city, that are looking to develop plans. But you know, the, given the fact that the city is highly organized, their strategies are probably going to be a little bit different from what we're doing. Um, and you've got the issues of cross-jurisdictional communication that um, you know we're trying to bridge. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's a little ominous. <laughs> if you knew me, you'd understand. <laughs> um, I'm a landscape contractor and I do a lot of work for um, homeowners and I've heard you use the term two year storm. Now I'm familiar with a hundred year storm. I'm always asking people, how much rain do you want me to uh, um, design for? And so what is the two-year storm? How do you qualify that? So the two-year storm, so the one-year storm is, I think, 2.7 inches. And so the two-year storm, I, I don't know exactly what the number is. It's slightly more than that. The 100-year storm is, you know, over eight inches in a 24-hour period. Which we have now. Here. Which we seem to have fairly frequently. But, but the, the, the MBE, the storm, current stormwater standards, are designed for that one-year storm. And so generally speaking, if there are opportunities to manage more and there's a willingness, that's great, but sort of the baseline is that, that one year event, and that's what development projects are being held to going forward. But if there's opportunities to quote unquote over manage, that's a great thing. Um, and again, it depends on probably your client or the, the amount of land they've got to dedicate to a practice like that. Um, and budget, yes, right. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Rick. Eric, do you have any numbers yet on the impact on the uh, contracting community or jobs created? So that's a great point. Um, we have let a number of contracts, but really what we've got, we're, we're working with our purchasing office right now in the late stages of, of issuing a, a number of big contracts. One is on the design side, we've uh, made our recommendations for six firms uh, that will be, it'll be $1 million per year per firm 
uh, up to one million dollars per year per firm. Um, open end essentially uh, design contracts that will be issued probably before the end of the year, and then we've got two construction contracts uh, for open end contractors that will be up to five million dollars per year. And so. Once, one, what I'm hearing from the consultant community is that there needs to be a guarantee of stability of funding. So it's not simply getting one contract. That's not going to lead you to hire more people on board necessarily. But if you've got one of these contracts that's uh, a relatively fixed amount for a, a set period, then you've got the stability to bring additional staff on board. I know that there is a lot of hiring going on. Um, and I think once we've got those in place, we'll be able to communicate more closely with those organizations to say, from a business standpoint, what has this meant for you in terms of staffing up? And we'll work with our central services folks and, and other and our business development folks to try to get a better handle on that. But that's really the piece that's missing is, again, the assurance of stability of funding. And I think um, the different jurisdictions have sort of implemented at different rates. And so there's Anaheim County is in a good place right now to be able to really ramp up. In some other cases, there aren't necessarily those dollars that people had anticipated. And I think, you know, by nature, a lot of these private sector companies are fairly conservative. They don't make it to a position where they brought staff on who they can't keep on board for a longer period of time since they'll be tra doing training and that sort of thing. So, yes, ma'am. Do you know how much uh, pollution comes from new construction runoff? And do we enforce that or what can we do with that? Sure. So, the, my program or our program is not, uh, is not responsible for new development. Most of that's handled through the Office of Planning and Zoning. And the reality is, even though folks don't like to see the forest come down or new development occur, new development is actually held to much higher standards in terms of stormwater management than historical developments have been held to. And so we've got a pretty good working relationship with the Office of Planning and Zoning. We communicate with them regularly, and uh, I have a lot of respect for the staff there who are involved in reviewing these plans going forward. And the effort, every effort is made to minimize those impacts from new development. And I think that probably at the state level, we may see additional requirements come down over the next couple of years to really sort of show that development going forward is pollution neutral. There were some discussions that were basically tabled this year in terms of creating what's called a nutrient offset program for new development um, that have not gone forward, but I think that those will be revived uh, probably once the new administration comes in at the state level. Oh, uh, sure, that's a good point. Uh, the watershed program also um, led to the hiring of seven inspectors and inspections of permits. So we've actually got now additional folks doing inspections of existing maintenance facilities um, that really were not being made, uh, inspected on a regular basis, and they're doing additional construction inspections. So that was one of the issues, especially with the economic downturn. There was um, significant um, manpower hit to the inspectors that were on board. And now that we've got the program in place again, it's allowed us to help staff out. Those, again, are not my staff. They're in inspections of permits. We work closely with them to make sure that um, we're on the same page. Yes, sir. Eric, as you're beginning to point out, there's a lot of different people in the county that are involved in these efforts. And I live in a community of 110 units that's just transitioning right now to uh, the final stage of uh, development and completion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in trying to get somebody to come out and might show interest in taking a look at the sediments that have been connected, uh, that have been collected during uh, the uh, uh, construction, I couldn't find anybody that was interested in doing that. Um, in the other case right now is we are moving to having to be responsible for our own five uh, microbial retention uh, areas as well as the swales and everything and the infrastructure associated with that. We're trying, we're having difficulty in finding somebody at the county level that can help us understand what the long-term maintenance costs are going to be with that. I would definitely encourage you to get in touch with folks in our program. Uh, Lisa Fraley McNeil, who's in the back here, is actually uh, involved in our modeling analysis group and has a lot of experience in terms of stormwater practice design and maintenance. We're actually hosting um, a training by the Chesapeake Stormwater Network for county staff on inspection and maintenance of these bio, uh, these ESD environmental site design practices because even within the inspection community, a lot of the uh, training that's gone on has been towards sort of the conventional practices. And so we are ourselves learning how to best do that. But certainly if you've got questions, I'd encourage you to get in touch with our staff and we'll help you. There's a lot of published material that's available in terms of the maintenance of these kinds of facilities and we can provide point in the direction of that. We can also make suggestions. One of the things that we're doing is older communities, now that we've got inspectors on board, some of them are getting compliance notices saying, well, this practice that was built in 1985 is not functioning as it was designed to be in 1985. And we may not want it to be taken back to 1985 standards, but we're offering the opportunity 
for those folks to get in touch with folks in our office to say, let's take a closer look. Has this, pro has this uh, practice evolved into something that's actually better from a water quality standpoint? Or is it something that we could come in and retrofit uh, rather than have it, you spend all this money to take it back to the original practice? And so we want to be a resource, uh, a technical resource for communities that are looking how to, at how to do this uh, and to be able to partner to the extent that we can. So uh, please Jared, do get that. Can you provide sure. a specific name or you personally for follow-ups? So sure. You, you can get in touch with me directly. Is the Thar County Quality and County yeah. Department, I mean, yeah. I can tell you as a citizen, that would put me over it's, it's daunting, and I know there's... Yeah. And, and Would you like a name? Yeah. Please just get in touch with me directly, and I'll make sure it gets passed down to the right staff Yeah. Yeah. Um, quick comment on the last issue. I think the Bush Skills Academy would be also an excellent resource to get in touch with, and you can contact Suzanne to uh, find the local steward. Um, with respect to outreach, uh, where, are you, where are you headed in, in that area? I noticed you, you now have a new uh, website. Yes. Uh, well, what's the on the, 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 the whole area of public outreach and how you're... Right. So it's a couple of things. One is uh, we don't have a, a new website. We've, we've tried to revise our website to make it more useful over the next six to nine months. We're actually looking at a complete overall because we still recognize that it's not quite as user-friendly as it needs to be, especially when we're dealing with the public. So we are, um, we are undertaking that process. Rob Fish is in the back of the room in the blue shirt is our education and outreach coordinator. Uh, he was brought on board, we, we stole him from the recycling group a few months ago, and so he's helping us out. We're also working with the Watershed Stewards Academy to formalize that relationship and have them be involved in education and outreach with the program. They've been doing a lot of that pro bono for a number of years and we're looking to, to create a, a more sustainable model there um, so that we can continue to work with them. But, We've got um, a presence on social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, and are working closely with the press to try to make sure that as we've got new projects going in the ground and whatnot, that we've got opportunities to get folks out there. So we're very mindful of the fact that in order to sustain public confidence or build public confidence in the program, there's got to be a very uh, a very concrete demonstration of what the program is doing. Sure. I'm going to add a comment to that. Um, we have a very educated and informed group here today. Until we can get this message out to the entire county, we're not going to make real progress. This is not an issue for environmentalists. This is an issue for our entire community. And so I can tell you as someone who has spoken in the northern part of the county, in the southern, the eastern, and western parts of the county, and uh, I view the entire county equally, not everyone understands this. And so not everyone is connected to this. I happen to live in Annapolis, not in the city itself, but in Annapolis. And I can tell you, my neighbors all understand it. I mean, they, they, they're pretty informed. But if you go to Glen Burnie and you're in a community where there's a lot of concrete and there's a disconnect from the bay, and folks have never actually been on the water, they don't understand the importance of it. I, I look at those concrete culverts, and that's what I grew up in. So having lived everywhere on the socioeconomic spectrum, I can tell you your view of this is very much colored by your personal experience. And so we have to figure out how to get the entire county connected to the importance of this issue and have it no longer be an environmentalist issue, but in fact be an entire county issue. And so that's why I want to start the dialogue today. I'm glad that all of you are here and view it as important. It's a good first step, but we need to really make that, build that bridge and make that connection everyone in the county. If you want people to appreciate the bay, you got to get them on the bay. And so I invite all of you to be, you know, leaders in our effort to start to uh, start to begin the outreach and make the connection across the county. I just want to add that. Yes, absolutely true. Thank you. And I think, you know, coming in, into government from the outside, one of the things that um, government's not necessarily great at is sort of touting its own successes. I think of uh, the Department of Public Works and uh, it's not, I, I had nothing to do with it, but I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the county is on a trajectory to upgrade its seven biggest waste, wastewater treatment plants by the end of 2017. We've got our biggest capital project the county's ever undertaken. The upgrade of the Cox Creek wastewater treatment plant is underway right now. And, you know, there's been a couple of pieces in the capital about it, but I think probably by and large people aren't aware of it, and, you know, to the extent possible, people like not to think about their, where their wastewater goes. But I think it's a pretty crowning achievement, and I think it's, um, you know, folks, who are in the trenches doing their work don't necessarily have the time to stand up and say, hey, look at me, look at what we're doing. And so I think to the extent that we've got the opportunity to, to 
bring that to the public's attention that it's important because uh, the county government in particular, I think, has been very successful at undertaking some really big achievements and uh, doesn't necessarily get the credit for that that, um, <coughs> folks, uh, that I think they probably deserve. So, uh, yes, sir. So what we need is more public order access. Is the county doing anything to make more areas available for the public to get on the water? Uh, the county executive may want to talk about that. But, yeah. <laughs> So it's difficult for folks to feel comfortable with that, and I can tell you I've experienced it personally. So I have challenged uh, Reckon Parks this year to increase water access, and in fact they have done that. And so we've made some strides in that in that direction, but uh, it is a real balance in working with the surrounding communities where the water access might potentially be available, or by the way, historically might have been available and is no longer. So we, that requires communication, it requires a commitment from county government, it requires leadership, uh, and sometimes you just have to take the time to go out and meet with the communities and talk to them. I'll give you a great example. I went out to Thomas Point. I was misquoted in an article on my commitment to water access. They thought I was going to have swimming off of Thomas Point. I was like, no, <laughs> I can't imagine you would swim there. It's not safe. It's surrounded by rocks. But that doesn't mean that the county shouldn't have access to water there, and I would like county residents to have first priority on that. It turns out the same people were getting the permits over and over again to be able to go there and are the license to go there and, uh, and fish. It's important that that be, that be available to the entire community. And so I made that commitment, so we're going to change our procedures. We also opened some beaches this year that historically have not been open. Well, you know what? They're beautiful. We have stunning, beautiful waterfront here that is owned by the county, but you have to go through residential areas to get there. And so we need to find the balance in, in increasing access, but also you know, being respectful of the communities and the quality of life in those communities. It requires a commitment, it requires a long-term vision for increasing access, and it also requires a little bit of patience. I personally don't think it's been a priority for many, many years. Uh, I happen to live in the community with young children. I, I have a family. My husband and I like to be out in the community. It's the reason I'm committed to libraries, because I'm in the libraries. I'm in, on the water with my family. And so, because that's my personal experience, I can see the importance of it. And I'm going to challenge the next administration to continue that. So, if we have made some progress this year, we certainly have to do a lot more. Oh, that's true. We have Fort Smallwood, uh, Fort Smallwood Park in the north part of the county. We're having a groundbreaking for a boat ramp there. One of the most beautiful parks in our country, not in our state, in our country. And I had never been in it. It's astounding. It is a beautiful, beautiful piece of land, and it's seldom visited. In fact, it was dangerous to go in there years ago, and now we've made a commitment to it, and um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be breaking ground for a new program. What is it? Uh, the date's on my calendar. I can't remember. The 28th? 28th of October. Oh, it's small one. Or it's small one. Y'all want to come? <laughs> come see the northern part of the county if you're, if you're from the southern part of the county. I think that's really where we build the bridge. Does that help? We are putting it on the website too, so when we increase access, we're posting it. The other piece I'll mention in this regard, and it's not necessarily titled water access, but each of these projects, especially the bigger projects, for us presents an opportunity for public education and outreach as well. This is, again, that North Cypress branch project that we went on in Zerna Park. After, I think it was the summer, or maybe the spring, I was down there with my son who's five years old. We were, you know, looking for frogs and tadpoles and all sorts of stuff and um, wandered through and found some toads. And, and, and on our way out, and it's a county of floodplain, on our way out, uh, another gentleman about my age was down there with his daughter with a big fishing net you know, going down to do the same kind of thing. And so I think that exposure, the opportunity to provide educational signage, to provide pathways, um, is something that really can go into every community, regardless of whether it's waterfront or not. And we've got projects that are 10 years old um, on the south of where you've got planners who go a path through the middle of that um, project and we go places so people can walk their dogs or get down there and it's it's a sort of a sanctuary or a community park for them. It's not necessarily something that's open to the public, but it's getting the people who live in those communities closer to that resource that was previously something that they avoided at all costs because it was a, a nice work. So I will tell you I have a house in Crisfield. And Crisfield is uh, part of Somerset County, one of the poorest county in the state of Maryland. My kids swim in that water every day that we're there. 
It is crystal clear. You can see, you know, the plants growing below the surface. I can see crabs. It's across from James Island, and the water is absolutely 100% safe to swim in. I would like to see every single inch of shoreline in our county the same. You should be able to go into the water anywhere in Anne Arundel County and have it be safe. And when that has happened, I will think we have uh, got to success. Are there any other questions? Um, if not, we can move on with our agenda. I'll be here all day, so if folks have questions for myself uh, or other folks in the program, uh, we're happy to take them.